I would like to welcome you to this evening's program, The Jewish Gambit, celebrating the legacy of Jews and chess in Winnipeg. I would like to acknowledge that the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada is located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge the water in the museum is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. The mission of the Jewish Heritage Center is to document, preserve, and share information on the cultural and historical formation of Jewish communities in Western Canada. The center also serves as an advocate for anti-racism and education on the Holocaust and on anti-Semitism. Our vision is to forge a pathway to the future by sharing compelling stories, such as the ones you'll hear tonight, and educating present and future generations. Now, I would like to introduce you to Daniel Stone. Daniel is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Winnipeg, where he taught East European and Holocaust history. He is past president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, and is presently the chair of our programs committee. Dan? Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll be the the MC for uh, for this evening, but before I start introducing the uh, the main speakers, I'd like to point out that this is a uh, that we're welcoming here the Manitoba Chess Association, and I'd like to ask uh, the president Blair Rutter to say a few words on behalf of the Manitoba Chess Association. Are you there, Blair? Uh, yes, just unmuting. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the uh, Jewish Heritage Center for organizing this event and for inviting us to be a part of it. Uh, the Manitoba Chess Association has a, a very uh, rich and proud history. Our origin dates back to uh, 1895. And a big part of that uh, rich history has been uh, the contributions of the uh, uh, Jewish community and in particular the uh, Winnipeg Jewish uh, Chess Club, which in fact is uh, uh, one of the founding organizations of, uh, of our present day uh, uh, association. So very much looking forward to uh, tonight's uh, presentations, celebrating those contributions. And uh, again, I wanna thank, uh, uh, thank uh, the Winnipeg or the Jewish Heritage Center for opportunity to be part of this and uh, looking forward to a uh, wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Blair, and thanks to the Manitoba Chess Association for helping out with this, uh, with tonight's program. Um, Jews and chess have seemed to have an affinity for, for many centuries. Uh, there are there are medieval manuscripts that deal with it. Maimonides mentioned it, although he didn't seem to really like chess players very much. His, the primary uh, comment that's quoted all, is that uh, professional chess players are unreliable and should not be used to give uh, testimony in court. The, in the 15th and 16th century, various holy books, particularly the Shulchan Aruch, uh, spoke highly of chess and even permitted it to be played on the Sabbath, although not for money. That's probably the source of Maimonides' complaint. And if chess was even permitted by the Jewish community of Cremona during a 16th century plague. All other games were forbidden on the theory that lighthearted entertainments were, why, were the reason for the plague. Uh, with this background, it's not surprising that many of the leading chess players in modern times have been Jewish. Many of the world champions have been Jewish. Tonight's program will feature a talk by Cecil Rossner, followed by commentary by Erwin Lipnowski, followed by a question and answer period. When you have questions, please write them on the chat line. I'll keep an eye on them, as will Cecil and Erwin and your questions will be answered. You can write them during the chat, during the talk, or you can wait till afterwards. Our first speaker, our main speaker will be Cecil Rossner. As you all know, the chess columnist for the Winnipeg Free Press, himself a chess player of note, 
Uh, I watched his style this afternoon on a YouTube video where he <clears throat> dealt with the chess hustlers in New York City's Washington Square Park and emerged uh, with five victories and no losses. And I encourage you to take a look at this five minute video on YouTube. Just type in Cecil Rostner and Washington Square Park. Uh, Cecil has had a special interest in local chess history. In his other life, He's a CBC journalist, pre executive producer of the Fifth Estate, and a specialist in investigative journalism. He's won awards for investigative journalism and written books on it and teaches a course regularly at the University of Winnipeg. He's particularly known to members of the Jewish, Ho Jewish Heritage Center and followers of Holocaust commemoration in Winnipeg for establishing the Minner Rossner Award, an award in the name of his mother, a Holocaust survivor. The award goes for the best high school essay on Holocaust subjects. And you can also see him in uh, the, the video of, uh, of Return, Return to Buchach, his where he accompanied his mother back to her city in, uh, in what's now Ukraine. He will be followed by Erd Lipnovsky, a highly rated chess player with a rating of master, who's represented Canada in international tournaments. He is a professor of economics at the University of Manitoba with a specialist in applied game theory. There, he has numerous publications and articles in this, books and articles in this one and a teaching award. Just to remind you, please put your questions on the chat line and now I'll ask uh, Cecil to get the to, to start the program. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, and thanks, Bill and Stan and everyone, uh, Mark, for uh, organizing this evening. Um, of course, chess, you know, has been a gigantic part of my life. Um, and it has with uh, a lot of the people on the call, as I see, I'm seeing a lot of uh, old faces and people I've known through the years, uh, a lot of them through the chess world. And uh, as a few people have already said, uh, ch uh, chess has uh, a rich history in Winnipeg and in the Jewish community. So I'm gonna talk about that history. Um, and uh, a big part of that history is, is uh, Abe Yanoff. So I'm gonna talk a fair bit about Abe and, and try, to, try to get an understanding of why the Jewish community uh, how it came about that the Jewish community contributed so much to the development of chess, not just in Winnipeg, um, but as you'll see uh, across Canada and even international, the Jewish community right here in Winnipeg made that contribution. So I'm going to, I've, I've got um, a presentation of photos and other things, uh, even a, a little video clip that I'm going to show you that's going to accompany my talk. So I'm going to share my screen with everyone right now. So if you'll bear with me, that's what I'm gonna do um, while I pull up my presentation. Um, and there it is. So I'm just gonna go to present and here we go. So I'm hoping everyone can now see my screen um, and I'll, I'll begin. So I think a lot of you know, this is, this is Daniel Abraham Yanofsky. Uh, some of you might know him as a city councilor in Winnipeg for many, many years. He was also a former mayor of the old city of West Kildona and a lawyer in, in Winnipeg. And maybe you also remember that uh, for many years he was on the city's executive policy committee. So he was a, he was a local politician for um, decades. But I don't think that many Winnipeggers actually know that Abe was also an internationally renowned chess player. He was a child prodigy. He won adult tournaments and exhibitions starting when he was 11 years old. In fact, he won the Canadian Chess Championship a total of eight times. The first when he was barely into his teenage years. He became the first ever chess grandmaster in Canada. In fact, he was the first one in what some people used to call the British Commonwealth. So before Britain had a grandmaster before Australia had a grandmaster. He was the first. And he traveled the world playing many of the top grandmasters, including world champions. 
I think most of you have heard of Bobby Fischer. Uh, Abe played Bobby Fischer twice. He faced the likes of Botvinnik, Smyslov, Bronstein, Petrosian, Spassky, the biggest names in the world of chess um, Abe competed against. And when he died, when Abe died 21 years ago, his life was remembered in chess columns and magazines around the world. So here's my question. How was Winnipeg able to produce a chess player of this caliber? What were the ingredients that allowed a young boy from a modest, poor immigrant family in Winnipeg to climb the heights in one of the most intellectual of all games. So I think to understand this, you have to go back a century to the conditions that gave rise to the founding of the Winnipeg Chess Club, Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club. And, and, and first I wanna go back even further to uh, and talk really briefly about organized chess activity even before that. Uh, Blair in his opening remarks made reference to the fact that our, our current club dates back to 1895, which it does. Uh, the Winnipeg Chess Club was founded in 1895 on McDermott Avenue. Um, eight people got together, all men by the way, at the Austin's Shorthand College um, in the Stovall Block on McDermott on September 24th, 1895. They created the Winnipeg Chess Club, which exists to this day. And by the way, this is what the Stovall block looks like today. I'm sure you all recognize that building on McDermott. Now I wanna show you the names of those eight people um, that were the founders of the Winnipeg Chess Club. And you'll get an idea of which community they represented. Coombs, Patterson, Austin, Rook, Alston, McLean, Law, Pattinson. That's a great name for the founder of a chess club, by the way, isn't it? Rook. Um, but I think you get an idea of uh, who, who was representative of the Winnipeg Chess Club uh, at its very founding. But, you know, this was uh, right around the turn of the century, and it didn't take long for um, Winnipeg to start changing. Um, and then as immigrants arrived in Winnipeg, uh, they began to leave their mark in the chess world, of course. So an Icelandic immigrant by the name of Magnus Smith settled in Winnipeg in 1898. And the following year, he became the Canadian chess champion. That's him on the left. He went on to the, win the national title three times. By the way, he's standing next to a very famous Hungarian grandmaster, Geza Morozzi, who had come to Winnipeg to give a simultaneous exhibition in 1906. So yes, immigrant communities started playing uh, a role in, in the development of chess in Winnipeg and the Jewish community in Winnipeg uh, was growing at this time as well. And, and, and as Dan mentioned, they had no shortage of role models in the chess world. As a matter of fact, many of the top players in the world at that time were Jewish. Um, example, on the left, Wilhelm Steinitz, um, the first undisputed chess champion of the world. And he was followed by, on the right, Emmanuel Lasker, who held the title for 27 years. Um, chess was a very favorite pastime for Jewish families in the old country. And a lot of uh, Jewish families took up the game of chess and a lot of uh, Jewish players became very, very good at the game. But Winnipeg needed some kind of spark to encourage members of the Jewish community to take part in organized chess activity. And, and that came af soon after with the founding of the People's Bookstore, which I think some of you may know about. It opened on Main Street in 1910. The owner was Beryl Miller. And in his recollections, he, he notes that his bookstore didn't even have any books at the start. What they had are, was mostly papers, newspapers, um, newspapers from Russia and different parts of um, Eastern Europe. Um, and that attracted uh, members of Winnipeg's socialist community. Um, and that 
that was the origins and that was the very early days of the People's Bookstore. Um, there's an ad of the People's Bookstore from a little bit later on. And as you can see by that time, you could go in there. It was on 816 Main Street at that time. You could go in there and subscribe to the Tag and the Forwards, uh, other uh, books in Hebrew and English and Yiddish. You could buy Jewish records there, sheet music and so forth. Um, and it became, this store became a pretty popular meeting space for the community. People came there to read, to discuss, to argue, to exchange opinions. And in 1919, same year as the general strike, a group of chess players decided to use the store as a space to pursue their game. And after a while, the Jewish chess club was officially born on Main Street in the People's This was the club's first president, Isidore Ish Hurwitz. He was a Russian immigrant to Winnipeg and he, he owned a hat manufacturing firm. So think about this for a second. You've got a, a bookstore that's catering quite a bit to the socialist community in Winnipeg. And now you have a factory owner presiding over a club in this store. Um, right in the same year as the general strike. And I think uh, that sort of becomes a symbol to me of the fact that uh, chess crossed a lot of different socioeconomic um, strata in Winnipeg. And I, I think this is true to this very day when it comes to the game of chess. Very few people bother to ask when you stepped into the club if you were a millionaire or if you were on welfare. It didn't really matter. The, the key thing for chess players is, um, are you interested in the game? And in fact, one of the club regulars at the time had this following motto. If chess interferes with your business, give up your business. Um, so it took actually a while for the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club to become competitive. Um, but by the end of the twenties, it had a group of young players who very quickly began to dominate chess activity in Winnipeg. In fact, the, the, the club hosted a mass match that pitted the Jewish club against all the rest of the City, the clubs in Winnipeg combined, and the Jewish club won by a score of 10 to 5. And this photo I'm showing you right here is a photo of the club members in 1931. And there's Ish Hurwitz right in the center. And uh, there's some other interesting people in that photo, and, and, I'll, and I'll get to some of them in a, in a moment. I'm going to tell you about some of the people who were members of the club around that time. Um, there's Abe Hellman and Al Mogul. They were two of the club's strong players in the 1930s. Mogul especially began to dominate in the city. He won the city championship in 1930, in 1932, in 1933. Hellman won it to 19, in 1936. Really, they gave anyone in the province a run for their money. Um, two other very strong players of this era were Joe Dreeman on the left. There's a picture of the young Joe and Dave Creamer. Creamer had been born in Bessarabia and immigrated, emigrated to Toronto and then to Winnipeg, um, where he worked as a tailor. He won several city and provincial championships before moving to Vancouver. And Joe Dreeman, I think many of you probably know who that is. Um, as a young man, he was a runner on the trading floor of the Grain Exchange. He eventually became sole owner of a grain firm, Dreamin and Company. And he was the first Jewish member of the Winnipeg Commodity Exchange. And of course, you know, the, the Dreamin building on Portage Avenue still exists to this day. But chess was his lifelong passion. Uh, he won several city and provincial championships and he continued to be a patron of the game until his death 21 years ago. Uh, by the way, Joe Dreeman's son is uh, David Dreeman, who's gained quite a lot of prominence in the United States for his investment strategies. Uh, and I've heard a few interviews uh, by David Dreeman, and he credits his father and his father's teachings about chess with some of his investment thinking. 
Uh, Joe always knew that even a hopeless position on the chessboard could suddenly be turned around for the win. And even if you think you're losing in a chess game, um, the, the, um, the messages don't fold quite yet. And David is fond of quoting a chess grandmaster who, when asked what his advice is for avoiding making bad moves, answered, sit on your hands. That was his advice. In other words, don't panic, just sit tight. And of course, we know that um, that's good advice in chess and that can be pretty good advice for investors too. There were others too. Morris and Frank Atnikov both became city and provincial championships, the champions in the 1930s. Uh, and chess activity ran in, in many Jewish families of that time. Here's someone from my own family, um, Robert Moser, a strong player and president at one time of the Jewish club. And uh, actually it was the Moser family that sponsored my parents to come to Winnipeg, to Canada uh, after the Holocaust. Speaking of um, families, Harry Yanofsky on the left was Abe's brother. Um, along with Abe Dreeman on the right, who was Joe's brother. They were also in the top tier of players in Manitoba for years. And, you know, the, the, though they were overshadowed to some degree by their brothers, they were very powerful players in their own right. So this was the atmosphere of the, of the Jewish club in the early 1930s. It, it was a welcoming place for any young person. And it was really the hotbed of chess activity in the city at that time. So I want to return now to, to Abe, Abe Yanofsky. His parents were Russian immigrants who moved to Manitoba when Abe was eight months old in 1925. Abe's father had been a college professor in the old country, and he took a job as a Jewish teacher in Portage La Prairie. And uh, his name was Abba. Abba Yanofsky was a learned man who wrote poetry and directed dramas. He played music. He was a scholar in Jewish literature and culture. He taught Abe Hebrew at the age of three and encouraged him to join the school choir when he was five after they moved to Winnipeg. Here's the Yanofsky family in 1933. Abe's parents and then the photo on the right you see Abe and his younger brother Harry. His early memories revolve around the hard times of the depression when he and his younger brother shared the same bed in their home on Manitoba Avenue. And a special treat involved paying a nickel and sitting through the same movie twice at the Palace Theater on Selkirk Avenue. In his autobiography, Abe tells the story of a walk down Main Street with his father when he was eight years old. So this would have been in 1933. They saw a chessboard and pieces in the window of the People's Bookstore. Abe convinced his father to buy it for $1. His father taught him the moves, and by day two, Abe was beating his father in chess. And um, Abe later recalled that his father had actually been quite a good player in Russia, but never played seriously in Canada. So his, so his father started taking Abe to the Jewish club, and there, were, there was no shortage of mentors and coaches to take him under their wing. Abe credits Chaim Kushner as being one of those early mentors, and Joe Dreeman actually became Abe's coach for quite a number of years. And his father, by the way, only allowed Abe to play on Saturday evenings and Sunday so as not to interfere with his studies. But it was obvious that Abe had a knack for the game. At the age of nine, he scored a draw against a visiting grandmaster to the city, Isaac Kashtan, in an exhibition. By the time he was 10, he was representing Manitoba in matches with the Minnesota team. And he was only, he was one of only four people to draw against a very famous and strong US Grandmaster Reuben Fine. And that's Reuben Fine on the left of this picture. When Reuben Fine came to Winnipeg to um, give a simultaneous exhibition. So there you see young Abe uh, staring dead, dead center at the camera as he's playing Reuben Fine. And if you look at the far right, there's Harry Yanofsky 
who's also um, playing in that same simultaneous exhibition. So in 1936, this guy, Bernard Friedman, visited Winnipeg. He was secretary of the Chess Federation of Canada. And he saw Abe at the Jewish club and immediately he knew there was something special going on here. So he invited him to come to Toronto and compete in the CNE and in some exhibitions in Toronto. So the Jewish club sponsored Abe to do that. So there's young Abe, age 11, packing his bags, heading off to Toronto to play in a tournament. So there were three events at the CNE in that year. There was a junior boys tournament, a senior boys tournament, and an adult championship. Abe entered all of them, <laughs> okay? Um, it was quickly obvious he was too good for the junior boys, so he went on to play in the other two, and he won 26 of his 27 games that he played there. Uh, there's the trophy he came home with. And he's, in his spare time in Toronto, he also gave a simultaneous exhibition, winning 17 games and losing five. So the Canadian chess world had, hadn't ever seen anything quite like this, an 11-year-old competing like this. And to give you some example of what Winnipeg thought about this, here's the front page of the Winnipeg Free Press when Abe came home from that tournament. Hail the conquering hero comes, it says. Young chess wizard returns home with laurels from the East. Um, so he was not just making a um, name for himself in the chess community, but the, uh, the city was starting to take notice that they had something kind of special going on here. Uh, the Jewish community, um, the Jewish chess club threw a banquet for him um, when he got back. It was at the home of Mr. Polmer on St. Cross Street, 50 people came. And after that, there was really no stopping him. Uh, in 1937, he won the Manitoba Championship and he placed fourth in the Canadian Championship. Uh, and actually, a, one of the funny stories is that, and, and a true one, is he kept winning so many Manitoba Championships that he was barred from entering them because no one else would enter if Abe uh, entered into the tournament. So in 1939, Abe got a very big break. Um, he was chosen to play on the Canadian team, uh, the Olymp Canadian Chess Olympiad team in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Now the Chess Olympiad is like the Olympics of chess. Every country in the world sends a team and then uh, they compete as they do in the Olympics. Um, but this is chess and this tournament was in Argentina in 1939. Uh, he got a further break when a couple other Canadian players dropped out and he was elevated to play second board for Canada. So uh, quite an honor for someone who was 14 years old at the time. Now remember, this is 1939. How do you get to Buenos Aires? Um, well, first he made his way to New York and then uh, the Canadian team got on board the SS Argentina and they, started out on an 18 day journey from New York City to Buenos Aires. Here's the tournament hall in Buenos Aires. More than 600 people crowded into this hall. It seems weird to see this picture in a time of COVID, but um, that was the scene in uh, Buenos Aires in 1939. All the best chess players in the world, Alakine, Capablanca, Tartakover, Stahlberg, Kiris, Nydorf. In fact, there's Alakine on the left and Capablanca on the right, two world champions uh, and perpetual rivals, by the way. Um, and here is 14-year-old Abe Yanofsky playing in this tournament. And, and by the way, he played very resourcefully and often quite brilliantly. And Abe playing on second board finished with an 85% score. So he won 85% of his matches and top honors. So he, he got the medal for the top score for all countries on second board. And one of his most brilliant games was against a champion of Peru uh, named Dulanto. So because this is a talk about chess, let's look at a little bit of chess, okay? Here is Abe. Um, uh, playing the white pieces 
against Dulanto playing the black pieces, okay? Dulanto has just moved his rook here, all right? Attacking Abe's queen. All the chess players are gonna know what I'm talking about here, but for you non-chess players, I'll try to explain something. This is a very menacing threat, why? Because if the queen moves away, say to here, you see where the black queen is and the black rook is? Black will swoop down with this queen and um, capture the pawn on G2, checkmate, checkmating Abe. So uh, Abe's in trouble seemingly here, about to lose the game or his queen. Uh, at this point, Abe comes up with a move that stunned a lot of people. And as a matter of fact, the move he played, uh, I have a book here, it's called Chess Highlights of the 20th Century. This move that Abe played is considered one of the chess highlights of the 20th century, according to this book. The move he played is this one. So, I'll, so you can watch it a little better. Abe's rook over here takes the pawn over here. It's, it's a seemingly crazy move because black can just capture that rook with his king free of charge. Um, but really it was the start of a very spectacular combination that led to Abe winning the game. Um, and here's the position a few moves later. Look where Black's king has been driven all the way into White's territory. And um, Abe checkmated um, the Peruvian champion. So this, this was quite a spectacular, again, remember Abe's 14 years old at the time. Um, and uh, so uh, this was quite the, um, quite the amazing feat for a 14 year old at that point. Um, again, uh, his, his uh, performance uh, was noticed. Here's a Canadian press story out of New York. A.B. Yanofsky laud lauded by world's chess masters. Alakine was the world champion at the time. When he saw that game that I just showed you, he came over and was quite impressed, wrote about it later, about how impressed he was uh, with Yanofsky's play. And um, now all of a sudden, uh, Abe was not just uh, famous and a bit of a celebrity in Winnipeg and in Canada, but uh, he was gaining some attention around the world. Um, by the way, that tournament started in September 1939. We all know what else started in September of 1939. World War II broke out while that tournament was beginning. What it meant was a lot of, and there were a lot of Jewish players on many of the European teams. Um, what happened was some of those Jewish, Jewish players refused to go home. Uh, in fact, they would have been in grave danger had they gone home. Um, and so it was a very um, dangerous and unusual time. Um, this, this is Moshe Nydorf. Um, he was on, he's Poland's greatest player. He was on the Polish team at this Olympiad in Buenos Aires in 1939. He never went home. He stayed in Argentina for the rest of his life and he became Miguel Nydorf, Argentina's most famous grandmaster after that. Uh, and this was the case with a lot of the European players. They didn't go back. Um, Yanofsky, of course, did go back to Canada, uh, but he came back to a very different kind of world. Um, his father had died a year earlier and he became the main breadwinner in his family. He dropped out of his grade 10 day classes at St. John's High to find a job. He worked from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. as an office clerk at the Atlantic Fruit Company. And then he'd go home for supper and then he went to night classes from 7 to 10 p.m. until he graduated high school at the age of 16. And his dream was actually to enter medical school. But the number of eligible Jews then was restricted. Um, so he was denied entry. Instead, he returned to his chess career. Um, 
and he won the first of eight Canadian chess championships in 1941 in Winnipeg when he was 16 years old. And these championships were held every two years during the war. <clears throat> Here's the next one, 1943. Uh, it was held in New Brunswick. He turned, there you see Abe, he's in the front row, third from left, standing. Um, Abe turned in quite an amazing performance here. He won 11 games, no draws, no losses. Um, if you're a chess player, you know that that is an unusual and remarkable thing to accomplish in a high level tournament. And in between these two big triumphs of his, he, he, he went on a 3000 mile tour of chess clubs across Canada and um, won all but six of his games of over 500 games that he played. Um, in 1944, he joined the Naval Volunteer Reserve and served until he was discharged in 1946. Now, when he came back to the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club after being discharged and the war is now over, um, he found an invitation that had come a few weeks earlier. And it was an inv invitation to play in a tournament in Holland. Um, and so this was very exciting. He couldn't really afford to go to Holland. so. The Chess Federation and the Winnipeg Free Press actually sponsored his trip. And actually, it was going to be, it was to be the site of one of his biggest successes. Um, this was the tournament he played in, in, in a town called Groningen in Holland in 1946. It was the first major post-war tournament. All the top players in the world were in this tournament. Um, including the de facto world champion, Mikhail Botvinnik, who then went on to become the actual world champion for many, many years from the Soviet Union. It was a 20 player round round, round robin tournament and Abe had been invited to take part. So um, he was one of the 20 people that from around the world invited to take part in this very famous post, first big post-war tournament. Um, here, here is a photo from that tournament. There is Abe on the right playing Max Ava. He is the Dutch champion. Of course, he was the big hometown favorite. Uh, and Ava had, was a former world champion himself. Um, so it was a huge, um, it was a huge deal for a Canadian um, to be invited to play in a, in a crowd like this amongst world champions. Um, and he was there. And, um, and I don't have a photo of it. I could not find a photo of it. And maybe someone afterwards in the discussion will tell me if there is a photo of it. But Abe's biggest triumph in this tournament was when he played Mikhail Botvinnik, the man who was going to become world champion. And really, the, the guy considered the strongest player in the world at that time. And Abe defeated Mikhail Botvinnik in this tournament, which caused a gigantic sensation in Holland. And again, I'm not gonna show you too much chess, but I'll, I'll show you the final position in that game, okay? Here it is. Abe has the white pieces and Botvinnik has the black pieces. And if you know anything about chess, you know that black's about to get checkmated with that overwhelming um, attack that the queen and rook are exercising over the, the lone black king. And so um, again, 1946, Abe is 21 years old, beating the strongest player in the world. Much to the delight of the Dutch crowd, by the way, because they were hoping for their champion to win the tournament. Botvinnik, by the way, despite losing to Abe, did go on to win this tournament. Um, so for the next eight months, actually, after this tournament, Janowski toured all, all over Europe, played in tournaments and exhibitions, traveled to Switzerland, Spain, England, Denmark, Belgium, and Iceland. He was good, but he actually wasn't good enough to support his family um, and himself playing chess. And, and later he would say about that, he said he decided then that, that he, he would enjoy playing chess as a hobby rather than as, a, as the principal means for trying to earn a living from it. Came back to um, Winnipeg. Went to law school, 
1948. Three years later, he won a scholarship as the best law school student in Canada. And uh, then he continued his, his uh, studies in Oxford, England. Um, and along the way, he became British chess champion while he was in England. Um, and he also wrote a book called Chess the Hard Way. It was, it was a little presumptuous to write an autobiography at a, such an early age, but uh, um, he had a publisher and he was pretty well known name in the chess world. Um, so uh, after getting his uh, degree in Oxford, he came back to Winnipeg with his wife Hilda and his young family and set up a law practice um, in Winnipeg and then uh, really played chess, uh, not professionally, uh, but casually after that, casually at a very high level. He played in every Canadian Olympiad team for many years after that. Um, that Olympiad was held every two years and he always, always did quite well. As a matter of fact, in the 1964 Olympiad, um, which was held in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, he, uh, Abe played so well that the FIDE, which is the International Chess Federation, decided to award him the grand, International Grandmaster title. So um, that title is reserved for the um, elite players in chess. And in 1964, there were not very many players in the world that held that title. There's quite a few more today, but uh, to be awarded the uh, Grandmaster title uh, at that time was uh, quite an achievement. Um, Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Abe uh, faced off with Bob. That, that's Bobby Fisher on the left. Uh, a lot of you uh, may have followed his career uh, when he became world champion and Abe played him uh, twice. Um, it took Fisher 112 moves and 13 hours to beat Yanofsky at the 1962 Interzonal Tournament in Stockholm. And then uh, here's the same two players meeting again six years later and the result in that game was a draw. Um, and there's actually Abe's score sheet. Um, all chess players record their moves in tournament games, and this is Abe's score sheet in his uh, 1968 game against Fisher. Um, now, in 1967, um, a big international chess tournament was organized right here in Winnipeg at the Fort Garry Hotel. Abe was responsible for organizing this. Um, and I've got to say, I was a teenager at the time and walk, and I had the good fortune of uh, walking in and watching some of this. It was on the, where was their big ballroom? On the seventh floor, I think, or the eighth floor of the Fort Garry Hotel. And um, it, was, it was a remarkable thing to, uh, to watch. There were 10 grandmasters from around the world, uh, actually nine and, and one international master. Um, and some of the world's strongest players came to Winnipeg um, to play. And there you see Abe on the right playing Boris Spassky on the left. Um, and Boris Spassky, of course, went on to become the world uh, chess champion. I want to play you, actually. Um, the CBC was at this tournament in 1967 and created a documentary about this tournament, the International Centennial. It was a centennial project, actually, 1967. So um, I, I want to play you a little clip from that documentary, just a 30 second clip, if you don't mind. And it's a clip from Boris Spassky. And the reason I like this is um, Spassky was a chess player and a journalist also. And I'm a chess player and a journalist. So I have a little bit of affinity. I'm nowhere near as good a chess player as Boris Spassky. Um, but then again, I don't know how good a journalist he is. Um, but uh, let me play you this clip, which I found a little bit amusing. Um, so again, this is, this is from the documentary CBC made at the time, and it's narrated by Stanley Burke. So some of you old timers might remember that that was the Peter Mansbridge of the uh, era. Stanley Burke was the anchor of the CBC National News and he narrated this documentary. So I'm gonna play this. Um, you'll have to give me a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, scroll it to the point that I uh, wanna play this small snippet for you.
is because this is important for me. Boris Spassky of Russia is one of the strongest players today and a top contender for the world championships in 1968. Uh, you know, I'm a journalist by profession, but at the moment I'm a professional chess player and most of my time I spend for chess, of course. Journalism doesn't give a lot of money and as for me, chess is much better. As the days go by, tension mounts for the players and the devotees, especially in this tournament where the score has been very even. First place could easily go to one of several competitors. Good rest and good health are essential for the stamina required to back up the hours of concentration and preparation. It's not always... Okay. Um, it's kind of a cool documentary if you're a chess freak, as I am. Um, but that's, there's Yanovsky, of course, um, in that tournament. Um, I wanna say, um, so that's 1967. In 1974, by the way, uh, Abe and I um, co were co-chairman of a, a tournament in Winnipeg. It was called the Pan American Championship. And uh, we invited the national champions of every country in North, Central and South America to come. Um, so it was a pretty big event uh, at that time. And I wanna make this point, I mean, uh, Abe Yanofsky was both a small and capital C conservative in politics, but I have to say he, I, I never observed him ever uh, letting that get in the way of chess camaraderie with people of all kinds of opinions. And so even in 19, in the 60s and 70s when the Cold War was still going pretty strong, um, one of the players we invited to come was the Cuban champion, uh, Eliazar Jimenez, that, that's him. Um, and it wasn't that easy uh, to navigate all the um, immigration and paperwork and so forth uh, to make this happen. And, uh, but Abe was a big part of actually making that happen. Um, and, and uh, Abe himself had played in the 1966 Chess Olympiad in Havana, Cuba, uh, where both Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, who were huge chess enthusiasts, would drop in to watch the play in action. Um, here's a picture of Che Guevara watching the action at the 1966 Havana Olympiad where Abe was a participant. And if you read any but a little bit of the history of this tournament, uh, the US State Department was very concerned and didn't really want to allow US players to go to this tournament because they were putting a lot of pressure on Cuba at the time um, and wanted to try to defeat this if they could. And in fact, uh, one of the American grandmasters that did go, Larry Evans, um, uh, the FBI opened a file on him at that time. Uh, as if uh, taking part in a chess tournament in Cuba uh, should, should uh, immediately bring you under some kind of suspicion. Uh, but we had a great tournament in Winnipeg in 1974 with all these national champions that came from all around the Americas. Um, here's Abe in 1986. This was the year he tried for his last Canadian championship, but he fell just short and he died in the year 2000. Uh, of complications brought about by congestive heart failure and cancer. There were more than 600 people at his funeral, including his old friend and mentor, Joe Dreeman, who would die later that year. And Abe was 74 years old uh, when he died. And the Jewish Chess Club continued on through most of Yanofsky's career, but it never really produced another chess player of uh, Abe's caliber, although it did produce a lot of very strong players. Uh, who are some of them? Um, in the 1940s, there was Leo Moser, a very talented chess player who turned his attention professionally to mathematics, where he excelled. He was a strong force on the local chess scene before he moved to Alberta. Then in the 40s and 50s, there was uh, this guy, Nathan Davinsky, a strong player and also a mathematician. He became a chess writer and a historian. He won the Manitoba Championship twice, 
and he represented Canada at two Olympiads. And his other claim to fame is he, he was once married to Canadian Prime Minister Kim Campbell. Um, and for um, wrote a, a number of very interesting books and moved to Vancouver in the 60s and, and like Yanofsky actually became a city alderman. Uh, then there was this guy, Albert Boxer, um, a very legendary figure in the Jewish club. He was president of the club for decades, chief kibitzer and coach to anyone who wandered into the club. Um, really beloved guy. And, and by the way, he, uh, I don't know if a lot of chess players even know this, he was a veteran of the Italian and North African campaigns in World War II. And um, he died in, in the year 2005 at the age of 87. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the members of the club are very diverse, everyone from business tycoons to uh, uh, veterans of the Spanish Civil War, uh, like this, this man, Marvin Penn. Um, chess player at the Winnipeg Jewish Club uh, who served in the Abraham Lincoln Battalion and the Mackenzie Papineau Battalions in Spain, a regular at the Jewish Chess Club. And finally, in the late 50s and 60s, there was a new wave of talented young players in the Jewish Club, among them people like Mark Shulman and a guy called Erwin Lipnowski that you're gonna hear from in a second. Um, and here's a photo of the 1963 Canadian Chess Championship, by the way. It was held here in Winnipeg. Standing on the far left in that white shirt, you see Mark Shulman, who became a lawyer in town, also represented Canada at the 1968 Chess Olympiad. And then if you go uh, all the way to the right, or almost all the way to the right, see that tallest person near the end of the row is Erwin uh, Lipnowski, a young Erwin um, who represented Canada at the 1976 Olympiad. And then in 1961, the Jewish club merged uh, officially with the Winnipeg club to form the Manitoba Chess Association, which is the entity that exists today. The club moved to the Hebrew Sick Benefit Association building on Selkirk Avenue. That's the one right next to Guns Bakery, which is where I first started going to the chess club in the 1960s. And while a lot of the kibitzers had had, and old timers had gone, were gone by then, there was still a very lively atmosphere and lots of kibitzing. And the club later moved to the Cornish Library, but now it's really, its headquarters is at the University of Winnipeg. Chess activity is still very strong in Manitoba. Um, and many of the greats of the Jewish club are still honored to this day with memorial tournaments. There's for instance, the Joe Dreamen Memorial Tournaments. And then, uh, the first Abe Yanofsky Memorial Tournament was held in 2003, and, and we invited six grandmasters from around the world to come and play in that tournament. And, and the, that tournament's been held every year since then. And by the way, I, I'm sure you've noticed that chess has been a very male-dominated uh, sport in its early days. Um, but um, in many parts of the world, in the Jewish community too, that's changing. Um, here's a picture of the Polgar sisters, the Hungarian Polgar sisters, a Jewish family where the parents, especially the father, said to himself, I'm going to see if I can turn my three daughters into chess champions. Do a little experiment. Can I turn them into chess champions? Uh, and guess what? He succeeded. Uh, all of them became extremely proficient in chess. Um, uh, probably the most so, Judith Polgar, uh, who's considered the strongest female player of all time. Uh, she became a grandmaster at age 15 and has since defeated 11 current or former world champions, all of them men. Um, so just to wrap up here today, uh, Manitoba Chess Association is still a uh, vibrant chess group in the city. Um, it's still diverse in the sense that there's rich and poor representing many nationalities. And remember those names I showed you at the beginning? Rook, Patterson, McLean, Austin. Have a look at this. Here's, here are the winners of, or the people who played in the 2019 Manitoba Junior. Have a look at the names and you'll see how much Winnipeg has changed in the last hundred years. And, um, and chess, and the people who play chess has changed along with it. Uh, so yes, Jews are still part of the Manitoba chess scene, 
but uh, they play alongside people from every other faith and ethnicity and community. And um, because chess, after all, is a, is a universal language. Uh, just as it was for Jews a century ago in Winnipeg, it, it remains a way for newcomers to find new friends and interact with a new country in a spirit of friendly competition and sportsmanship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecil, for that wonderful presentation of the history and, and the spirit of chess in, in Winnipeg and around the world. Erwin, uh, would you like to add something, please? Erwin, uh, you are muted. Okay. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Okay, I was going to say, I think you should regard um, my role as kind of a footnote to what Cecil uh, presented. I'm in awe at how uh, academic and scholarly his presentation was. But uh, if you'll allow me to just fill in a few little details, I'll start with the last one about Laszlo Polgar, who set out, Cecil said, to uh, uh, create uh, chess champions. I believe his goal was to create chess geniuses and uh, uh, a testimony or a testament to his, uh, I would say, misguided efforts was that all three daughters of his have decided to raise their children to be normal, <laughs> not to have this quest to become a genius. In fact, the very idea of creating geniuses is kind of misguided. But um, I saw a recent interview uh, uh, with uh, Laszlo Polgar in Florida, to, uh, where he's retired. And uh, he still feels that they missed the boat. They should have created geniuses in the same way as, as he did. So ba basically, he destroyed their childhood. They had to practice uh, chess and rigorously train seven hours a day. So um, I think he, he isn't the only one who has had this um, propensity to vicariously try and uh, achieve uh, greatness through their children rather than uh, uh, on their own merits. But anyway, that's one little detail. The other little detail um, I feel I should um, add to was Cecil's reference to Joe Dreamen. I say this because uh, two of the people that I noticed are present are Joe Dreamen's nephew, David Cohn, and his son, Solly Dreamen, who's in, uh, in Israel, I think in, uh, in Ben Gurion. Uh, at Ben Gurion University in uh, in Beersheba, sorry, and um, um, Joe Dreamin is not uh, unconnected with uh, the origin of chess uh, in terms of the development of the chess club, and even with his parting uh, uh, brilliant gift. I'll talk about that just in a moment. But um, uh, at at uh, the eulogy that David gave for his father. Um, he talked about how he became a contrarian investor. And he said he learned contrarianism on his father's knee. And he described contrarianism um, as Cecil correctly identified it in part one, which is even if things look real dire, look very ho hopeless, don't despair. Often there's a kind of silver lining. There are resources. So you may be able, if you're really skilled and you hang in there, you may be able to turn it around and transform defeat into victory. The part of that, uh, that uh, with apology in a way, I, that uh, Cecil left out is the, uh, I'm not sure if it's the obverse, but it's the other side of the coin. Namely, if you happen to have, quote, a winning position where you have a decisive advantage and you're riding high and you start to become overconfident, suddenly things might implode and blow up in your face. And what should have been a smooth, um, seamless victory suddenly becomes a bitter defeat. So that's the other part of contrarianism. It was to have an even-handed kind of approach. So what did this have to do with chess? So I'll just mention this very briefly. This isn't really about the Jewish chess club, although indirectly it is. So Joe Dreamen had, uh, for economic necessity reasons, he'd given up on, 
Um, I think his ambition was to go into medicine, but his father passed away. He had to earn a living. So he became a golfer on the stock exchange and he was running errands. And he noticed that uh, a lot of the 40 year old or 40 plus year old uh, brokers more senior than himself were, if I can use a blunt word, croaking. They were passing away of cardiovascular failure. Uh, medicine wasn't then what it is now. And uh, he decided if I want to have a career doing this, I have to find a hobby that helps me relax so I don't have that same fate. Um, Cecil mentioned that Joe passed away at 87. But here's a young Joe Dreamin at maybe 20 or 21 thinking ahead. So he happened to pick up the free press and he saw a story about a fire. I think he told me this is on page three of the Winnipeg Free Press. A fire broke out on the second floor of People's Bookstore, the chess club. And the chess players refused to leave. Why did they not want to leave? Because who knows, maybe their opponent would, you know, take their bishop or cheat in some way and uh, they had to stay and stick it out. They finally left the building by force when the fire brigade came and removed them involuntarily. So when Joe read this, it seemed to make a, a very strong impression on him. So since he was a, came from a very impoverished background, he couldn't go up and buy a chess set, even if the sets that Abe, uh, Abe's father bought were only $1 each. What he did is he went to the uh, William Street uh, Public, Winnipeg Public Library. He went to the Encyclopedia Britannica and taught himself how to play chess. Of course, he had to fashion a chess set. So he told me he used uh, bread, molded it into chess pieces. He drew up a chess board and uh, taught himself chess and became a very proficient chess player. Actually, he became uh, um, one of the uh, founding fathers of the Winnipeg uh, Jewish Chess Club. So the origin of the chess club is not unconnected with, uh, with Joe's experience uh, in getting into chess, nor is uh, the origin of contrarianism that, uh, that uh, David absorbed uh, unconnected with uh, chess as well. Okay, so that's uh, a kind of uh, aside, although a lot of the comments I wanna make are stream of consciousness kinds of comments. Um, Cecil mentioned uh, that Marvin Penn was in the uh, brigade of idealistic Canadians who went overseas to fight Franco and the fascists in the International Brigade uh, to keep Spain from becoming fascist. Um, someone I saw in the chat asked, is uh, Marvin any relation to Irma Penn? Yes, Marvin was Irma's husband and uh, he predeceased her and she very generously donated uh, money that Marvin had left her. Marvin became a stockbroker. So I'm not sure if he changed from a socialist to a capitalist, but uh, evidently he left enough money, he bequeathed enough money to uh, support the future of Jewish education and so on in, uh, in Winnipeg. Another person who was in that brigade, I believe, was Morris Desser. And um, the funny thing is that people who um, are, lead quite a prestigious so, or have quite a prestigious social position in Europe, they come to Winnipeg, which by the way was the third largest city in Canada in the 30s, and they end up in a very lowly station in life. Uh, one person who was not Jewish was um, Zabo, was a, a chess master, was very, very strong. Um, I think he was, he became a bricklayer in, in uh, Manitoba. I, I think he had a more important position in, in Hungary. But it's not uncommon for people who do come over and they end up in chess not to have a very high station in life. I had heard that uh, that uh, Morris Desser, who was kind of a kingpin in the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club, um, uh, when he was in Winnipeg, he was a jobber who used to se sell uh, confectionery candy. He had a little truck that he worked out of and deliver his merchandise to, uh, to various grocery stores. I heard that he, in... Um, Desser had served in the British Army as a colonel. I'm not sure if that was uh, that was uh, accurate or not, but that was the story I heard. Anyway, that is a kind of uh, a segue to talk about the nature of uh, chess clubs. So one of the striking things about chess clubs um, is the uh, heterogeneity of the clientele. When I say clientele, I don't mean patrons who end up paying money to, to belong, but people who drop in and play for virtually uh, at no cost. Um, 
and uh, it, it's rare to find an institution that has such a diversity of, of uh, ideologies, of uh, um, means from the quite wealthy to the quite impoverished. Cecil had already alluded to that. Um, ideologically from um, outright communists uh, to people who are, if not Milton Friedman type capitalists, at least they've been beneficiaries of the capitalist system. So just to, to give you uh, one example, one of the people who frequented the chess club, who was actually quite a weak player, was uh, a player who's, who was an, a labor organizer. This might resonate with uh, Avram if I haven't told him, told him the story before. He used to go around in, uh, in the 1930s trying to convince people to sign up uh, to become a union. Um, shades of uh, Amazon and uh, Jeff Bezos or, or uh, shades of Walmart uh, trying to keep unions out. Anyway, he would stand on a little uh, platform and uh, talk about Section 91 and try and convince people to sign up. Um, his, I said his nom de guerre was uh, Vasil Vasilevich, his, his real name, his surname was Guberman. And he somehow had an a, a ability to get on to a radio talk show. Uh, the radio station was CJOB. Every morning they had a thing called Beef and Bouquet. He would somehow get on every morning, even though it was quite hard for someone who didn't know how to do this, to get through. And he would start by saying a big bouquet to Joseph Stalin. <laughs> this, was, this was his hero. Anyway, um, what happened is, uh, this is again a bit of social history. Um, the uh, uh, big unions came to, to Winnipeg, uh, an organizer from the uh, um, AFL-CIO named Henry Herbst, whose name was pronounced Hoipst, and uh, they muscled in and uh, they had a ceremonial changing of the guard and uh, Guberman turned over the keys with tears pouring down his eyes. I'm sure he envisioned, you know, the possibility of being at the bottom of the river with concrete shoes if he didn't do this transfer of power. Um, Guberman uh, remarked, uh, I want everyone to know this is the happiest day in my life. So that was a uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, bit of social history. Anyway, the, uh, the chess club did have people who were, as uh, Cecil already mentioned, academics such as Leo Moser. Another uh, mathematics professor was J.W. Lawson. Um, at the other, uh, this is after the, the merger took place uh, between the Winnipeg Chess Center and the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club. At the other end, there were, uh, as I mentioned, communists or people who were just ordinary people who didn't necessarily have very much education. Uh, the common uh, thread, the common element was they all loved chess. And the standing you had uh, uh, in the chess club related to your strength, not to your social station. So some of the lowliest players who happened to be quite skilled um, automatically uh, had standing, even though uh, the person whom they defeated outside the chess club was far more respected, far more renowned than they were. Um, the culture of the Winnipeg, uh, of the uh, Jewish chess club was extremely, uh, was totally different than the culture of the Winnipeg chess club that merged for financial reasons uh, to become the Manitoba Chess Center. Um, the, the Winnipeg Jewish, uh, the uh, Jewish chess club had um, a prevalence of kibitzing. Um, Din was very prominent. Uh, you know, the uh, Jews are known as the audible minority. Um, they, they got this uh, title when uh, Dershowitz was asked whether the Jews are a visible minority and he replied, no, but um, I'm sure they're an audible minority. Anyway, the, the Jewish chess club had this kind of, uh, um, e depending on your point of view, either annoying din, annoying background noise, kibitzing, off-key singing, insults, teasing, banter, um, whereas uh, the Winnipeg uh, chess center that merged with them would have the Reverend John McDonald playing the Reverend, playing uh, Professor John uh, J.W. Lawson or Kent Oliver uh, engaged in a serious game of chess. And, you know, uh, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, they sat there respectfully, silently. So the atmosphere was totally different. So uh, apart from the uh, tremendous diversity in uh, 
in uh, in uh, class between uh, and in ideology between members of the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club. Once they merged with the Winnipeg uh, Chess Club, there was this tremendous uh, uh, gulf between the two groups in terms of the standard of, of conduct. As you heard this loud noise going on and the teasing and the joking and the kibitzing, um, it was not uncommon to watch people from the Winnipeg Chess Club raise their brow, their eyebrows, and uh, uh, in disapproval and uh, and and in annoyance. So it was quite a, an interesting kind of blend. It never quite uh, uh, became uh, um, a harmonious kind of uh, uh, marriage. But anyway, it was it was very interesting to observe. Um, instead of talking about the people as characters. Um, uh, well, uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the people as, as personalities. Um, the kingpin, in a way, who actually physically resembled Edward G. Robinson, uh, who played the role of a, a, a very skilled uh, card player in one of his uh, famous movies. Um, that person was Morris Desser, and uh, um, Cecil showed him his, showed you his photo. Um, somehow the audio was off when he had to come to the word Desser, so, and he called him Moishe Lips. So it was Morris Desser. Um, and uh, Desser was uh, um, one of the, probably the most skilled player uh, in the club. And um, um, he would play, he would give odds. So when he played Mickey Brown, um, he would, uh, Brown was a rook boy. What did that mean? It meant that he would give him odds of a rook, which is a very significant handicap. <laughs> And uh, they would uh, play, and uh, um, more often than not, Desser would win. But to, to sort of talk about the the uh, how personal it became, um, I still recall vividly um, when Desser was about to check Maid Brown, and um, it wasn't enough to simply, you know, respectfully, you know, move his knight to f6. That was the position, and say check Maid. Instead, he had to kind of humiliate Brown. So what he did is he summoned me and he summoned another regular young player named Oli Helston. Uh, he said, boys, boys, come here. I want you to see this. Meanwhile, Brown started to sink in his chair. He put his head, uh, he, he raised his hat, oh, a fedora type of uh, hat uh, over his, uh, till it went all the way down, covering his eyes. His ears became beet red. He was waiting for the guillotine to fall. And when everybody was assembled, and ready to go, uh, Desser picked up the knight, swung it in, swung it in the air, and said, "Check." <laughs> and of course, it was checkmate, and uh, and uh, Brown fell, sank even further into his into his seat. So this type of conduct, I mean, people would find very offensive uh, and uh, um, unacceptable nowadays. But that was the culture at the time. So. Uh, this type of grandstanding and horseplay and so on that went on was common. And maybe, maybe this is why I was so attracted to it. I found it very amusing and uh, it's kind of imprinted in my, in my brain um, after all these years. Um, so again, I'm gonna talk anecdotally about things I learned in the chess club uh, rather than do a sociological study of the ethnicity and ideology and so on in a more scientific way. I'll just talk about a few random events. I started to go to the chess club when I was 11 and uh, they had moved from People's Bookstore and they moved uh, till they were almost across from the Chesed Shalemis, which is uh, the burial, uh, um, I guess it's a mortuary for the Jewish community on the other side of Main Street. And they were in a, in a restaurant called Fran and Luz. And uh, uh, in the back room of this uh, of this uh, um, diner, a very modest diner, was the Winnipeg was the Jewish Chess Club, and uh, not only chess players frequented this place, but also non chess players. So one of of that uh, one of the people in that category was somebody named um, named uh, Leo. Um, why am I? <laughs> I remember this for sixty something years because I was eleven at the time. Um, Leo Pinto was his name, and Pinto was playing gin rummy uh, next to the chess players, and he was drinking his tea Russian style with a, a sugar cube somehow on his upper lip, and it's, he would drink, the, uh, the sugar would, would dissolve, and he would have tea sweetened just to perfection, 
anyway, he, he did something, I guess, that uh, warranted uh, uh, ridicule and people started to insult him and they started yelling, ah, oh, Leo, Leo, Leo. And I was 11 and I got caught up in the uh, excitement and I started to shout, Leo, Leo, <laughs> even though I didn't really know this person. And suddenly with a laser intensity, out of all the people around shouting Leo, he focused on me and he points to me. He said, and I was 11 at the time, and I remember this vividly. He said, Mr. Pinto to you. And I remember that uh, if I have to list the things that I learned at a chess club, respect for one's elders was one of the things. And I learned it at a very early age. And that was uh, a lesson that sticks, that stayed with me. Uh, not that I necessarily uh, adhere to that principle. I, I was uh, later on guilty of also kibitzing and also uh, ridiculing people, but uh, I still remember that uh, event quite uh, quite uh, vividly. Um, there's something unique about uh, Jewish chess clubs. Um, oh, I should finish instead of randomly uh, uh, swerving right away. Let me just continue with this uh, tale. The, the Fran and Lou's uh, diner then became renamed Fran's Cafe. Uh, didn't cost any money to do that as long as you had a seven up sign accompanying that uh, the new name. She threw Lou out and so you know took over the diner and it became Franz Cafe. The Tuchesco continued there until they moved to the Hebrew Sig Benefit Hall, which is when Cecil started to attend the Jewish chess club. They were at the top uh, floor of the uh, Hebrew Sig floor, Hebrew Sig Benefit uh, uh, Hall. And they remained there until they were displaced by the Montefiore Club, which uh, was also a, a group of more well-to-do Jewish uh, individuals who used to gamble at the Hebrew Fraternal Lodge, also in the, the North End on Maine. And when they moved to the Hebrew Sixth, the chess players were moved to the basement. And they had this very, very modest uh, location. It was almost an impossible location. Um, and uh, that was the uh, almost the final resting place. From there, they moved to the Winnipeg Public uh, Library on Cornish, on Cornish Avenue. This is the place that Abe managed to secure for them. On each occasion that they moved, it was really because they had no money and they didn't collect dues. And uh, this is why they uh, they were on the move. In fact, before this uh, talk started, I, s I remarked to Cecil that uh, the the continuous movement. Of the, of the Jewish chess club was a kind of metaphor the, of the wandering Jew. They kept going from location to location uh, because they really had nothing, uh, no money, and uh, they kept uh, having to go to more and more uh, um, modest or less expensive accommodation. Till now, I think they're uh, uh, beneficiaries of the, of the uh, University of Winnipeg, which allows them to, to inhabit uh, a room once a week or something like that. Anyway, um, some of the people uh, um, I mentioned, uh, um, I, mean, I mentioned the, uh, their, their personality, I didn't want to call them characters, but uh, um, they, were, uh, they, were, uh, they were in fact uh, the individuals whose uh, memory uh, is, is uh, etched in my memory and uh, um, they're kind of uh, the reason that the chess, uh, the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club is so alive in my mind. I'll just mention one more, uh, when I talked about the commonality of Jewish chess clubs um, in the world, um, I, I visited uh, Tel Aviv and they had a, a chess cafe on, uh, on Diesengoff and Frischmann and uh, Again, one of the things that sticks in my mind that reminded me of the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club was some character named Altman, who would make a move, and uh, and he would say this. Uh, I'll say it in Yiddish, and then translate it. He would say, "Oi, spiel ich schön," which is, "Oh, do I play beautifully?" <laughs> he couldn't get over the uh, the uh, the beauty of his own moves. So this reminded me of the kind of self-aggrandizement that sometimes went on in. Uh, in the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club that I saw, maybe not quite to the same degree. Um, 
The other thing that I saw, this is not at a Winnipeg Jewish uh, chess club, or sorry, at a, at a Jewish chess club. When I was in Toronto, I used to frequent the chess club there. And they had these, the, but uh, what, 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 what is common, the commonality was the ferocity of the competition and the insulting uh, language that sometimes occurred. There were two players who were playing and I was just a fly on the wall watching this go on. I believe they were both probably Yugoslavian, maybe one was Croatian and the other one was Serbian, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, one kept beating the other one repeatedly and mercilessly insulting him each time. And uh, the, the victim, you know, finally said to him, okay, the next game, let's play for money. So the tormentor turned to him and said, no, 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 no. The next game we play just for hate. <laughs> No, I found this funny. Uh, many people would not. But anyway, I thought that this kind of uh, was indicative of quite how ferocious the competition can become. I mean, chess is, after all, a bloodless activity. Uh, even checkmate does not involve actually executing your rival's king. It just means cornering the king, threatening the king. And that's checkmate. The game ends there. It's bloodless. Nothing, nothing more uh, violent than that happens. And yet the intensity of the uh, rivalry somehow, somehow was, was so extreme that um, it actually could become almost physical. Uh, Erwin, uh, your stories remind, I, I want to say one quick thing, but I also want to hear from the folks out there, like if there's any questions, but your stories remind me of, there's a famous interview of Bobby Fischer by Dick Cavett um, from around 1972 or, or, or so in which, uh, or maybe a little earlier, and Dick Cavett asked Bobby Fischer, what do you like most about chess, about the game? And Fischer said, I like the moment where I crush my opponent's ego. Right, right. That, that was Fischer's uh, comment. But uh, you know what? I see a lot of um, historians, and chess historians and other historians and old timers in the crowd. I would love to hear if there's any questions or reflections or observations from, I don't know how much time we have, Dan. Like, I'm glad you. Yes, we have we have some questions. Uh, I'm glad I'm to gonna... in the old days, pre-COVID, when this was not electronic, you would have somebody with a shepherd's crook bring pull a guy off the stage. <laughs> so un un unlike that era, now we have to rely on somebody like uh, Cecil or Dan intervening and saying, you know, you're running off at the mouth. Enough is enough. So I'm glad that uh, I'm glad you uh, stopped me at that point. Thank you. Your stories are wonderful, Erwin, but uh, it is, <clears throat> there are a lot of, I can tell from the chat line that there are a lot of interesting people out there with some good, with, with, with suggestions and questions. And I'm going to take it on myself to half answer the first one because you've already answered the other half. Yes, um, er, Marvin Penn was married to Irma and Irma was the, for quite a while, was the archivist of the Jewish Heritage Center. And in fact, the archives at the Jewish Heritage Center are the Irma and Marvin Penn archives. So um, <clears throat> that's another of our connections to, to the chess world. But one of the first questions that came in from Louis uh, <clears throat> Kessler was asked, uh, asking whether the whether there was a plaque on the building downtown where the chess club was first uh, established, I, an I, historical uh, historical plaque identifying it, I don't believe so. Um, we we were never listed, for example, even as a footnote in uh, Alan Levine's book. I mean, chess was nowhere. You know, it, it was not like uh, the Glendale Country Club. It never had, you know, the kind of more uh, well well healed Jewish people, other than Joe Dreamin <laughs> and a few uh, others. But mostly, it was fairly impoverished people. Um, you know, working class people. Uh, and it was never, it wasn't regarded as significant enough to be in that book of Alan Levine's. Uh, there's still time though for things like that, perhaps, who knows? Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to do a, a, a new edition there. Al, it's, a, it's a very good book, but it's not, it's not perfect. And that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the problems I can see. Um, Adrian Kettner asked whether women were involved in the Winnipeg Jewish Chess Club. Now he asked us very early on, uh, you said that they have become active, uh, women have become chess players, but what about uh, 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Uh, I, uh, Erwin will know this better than, than I, but I, I think not. Uh, it was extremely rare 
for uh, a woman to take part uh, in those days in a in the chess club or in a chess tournament. Very very rare. Not not completely unheard of, but it it for a whole bunch of cultural and historical reasons it, it didn't happen. It started happening in other countries. Uh, I. I, I watched some of the Fischer Spassky match in 1972 in, in Iceland. I went to Iceland and, and uh, I played in a 30-30 in a tournament, it's called. And I'd say about 30 or 40% of the players were female. So, so in a variety of other countries, uh, women have been encouraged to play chess. And uh, even to this day, and Blair can address this, uh, it still is nowhere near, um, female participation is still, it, it's, it's, it's there. But uh, it's still a predominantly male um, pursuit, I, I would have to say. Correct me if I'm wrong, Blair. In, uh, I have a question. The, yes. My question is, where did Abe Yanofsky fit into the program? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by that? Uh, there was a good, a lot. A lot well, of, a lot of discussion. Abe, Abe, Abe Yanofsky was very a good a good friend of mine, and I was originally interested in this program because of Abe Yanofsky, who, of course, was a um, was a chess uh, um, major colonel. Grandmaster, excuse my uh, putting in. Uh, Cecil gave, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes on Abe Yanofsky with pictures and coverage of various tournaments. Uh, it, 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 was, it was a very major part, portion of the, pres, uh, of the presentation. It was the, boat, the, main, the main part of the presentation. Maybe you tuned in a little late, but I, I see that this is being recorded. So I think maybe this will be available for people to watch afterwards also. Yes, all our programs are, are posted on the Jewish Heritage Center YouTube channel. Uh, sometimes the same day, often it takes a day or two to, to uh, download it and then put it into the, onto the YouTube channel. Then we have a question from a, a name that somehow sounds familiar, Elliot Lipnowski, uh, asked whether the, the uh, People, this again, this is fair, this was rather early in the presentation. Whether the members of the chess club studied chess together in the chess club, or whether they uh, the sole activity was meeting to play. Uh, again, Irwin will know the earlier history of this. I mean, when I I started um, I started going to um, the chess club in the in the late sixties, um, and uh, and. You know, I was a teenager, and uh, and amongst the junior players like myself, we 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 played together. We sometimes we studied together. Um, we went, we traveled to different tournaments together. So there was a bit of that, but I think generally speaking, no. And 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 I think Irwin can address that. Generally speaking, the club was a place you got together and had fun and kibitzed. Yeah, it was. There was no joint work together. No. There was camaraderie in a way, but uh, um, it didn't involve, you know, mutually helpful uh, um, chess activity. It was purely fun, a fun place to be. So how did the how did the chess players learn to play chess? Uh, good question. Uh, you know. That's why I think Abe's influence uh, carried on. Uh, everyone knew about Abe. Uh, everyone knew that there was this, and he would drop by every now and then too. Everyone knew that Winnipeg had somehow, somehow produced this remarkable chess player. And I think that that actually inspired a lot of people to try to get better. Like for myself, it means when, it meant going to the public library on William Avenue and taking out every book I could get my hands on. And I think that's how a lot of, and playing postal chess <laughs> at the time. Uh, and that's how a lot of uh, play, you know, young people of the time uh, got better. I remember going to the co-op bookstore to buy a, a Russian chess magazine called 64. It was in Russian. It came out every week and it had all the, all the latest um, games, for, you know, uh, and that was about the only way to be, stay current in those days. There was no internet and there was, <laughs> there was nothing else. And uh, a lot of 
a lot of young people who wanted to get better uh, did things like that. And, uh, and Winnipeg produced, Irwin, chief among them, some very outstanding chess players through the years. Actually, I ended up, my very first chess book was Modern Chess Openings, which I bought at the co-op bookstore, um, whose manager was Roland Penner. Those people from Manitoba may recognize that name. Um, became a well-known politician and uh, professor of uh, law. And um, that was the beginning. I, I mean, my, my it was all self-taught. You know, standing at the at, at the book section of the of Eaton's reading Alekhine's my best games of chess or Rady's best games or whatever, it was all self-taught. It wasn't involved. It didn't involve any organized chess or coaching or anything like that. I'm so happy to, and, and I'm happy to say that uh, if any of you watch the Queen's Gambit on Netflix, um, Beth Harmon has a copy of Modern the book Erwin just mentioned Modern Chess Openings, and I see Tony Boron is here on, uh, on, in the call and uh, he's familiar with the chess book market. And suddenly there's been a resurgence of interest in uh, that book and uh, of all things chess as a, result of that, uh, of, of, as a result of that chess series. And I think one of the good things about that series is there's, it, it's shown to girls and women and girls especially that, yeah, I can, I can take up the game of chess and I can succeed in this. So, I, I think it's it's had some positive effects that way. The, the next question comes from Irina Karshenbaum from Calgary. I'd like to point out that a month and one day from today, Irena will be making the presentation for the Jewish Heritage Center on the little synagogue on the prairie. This is a small town, a rural synagogue that was moved into the Calgary Heritage Park. And she'll be telling us she's one of the, she was the prime mover, one of the prime movers in making, in preserving the the, uh, the synagogue, and uh, organizing its presentation into the Calgary Heritage Park. But for tonight, she asks uh, she was looking at the uh, Buenos Aires photograph and asked about the swastika. Uh, it was it was the German team was there. The team from Germany was there. Um, and so that, um, that uh, poster that you saw represented the flags of all the teams that were there. It, it literally, I, I think the pre-game ceremonies happened like August 26th. It, it literally happened days before war broke out. And then the first rounds were right as war was breaking out. And amazingly, Russia, you know, like you had matches scheduled between Germany and Poland. Can you imagine? Germany is attacking Poland on September the 1st, 1939. And, and there's, there's a scheduled match between the, uh, the teams going on. Um, so yeah, that's why, that's why you saw that there. I noticed that the only two, the only two flags that I saw in the poster was, were the, uh, the swastika and the Polish flag. Okay, yeah, I'll have to go back and- That's and, the, uh, the white eagle on the, on the background there, a little bit up and to the left. Now, Lewis Kessler has a, a comment that I'm gonna turn into a question, whether the character of Borkoff in Queen's Gambit was modeled on Spassky. You know, perhaps, um, probably, I would say. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot of speculation about who, who was the model for all the characters. But uh, I think it's, it's a bit of the uh, cliche rush, you know, steely eyed Russian chess guy. Um, so yeah, it could have been, could have been Spassky, but probably could have been any number of other people too. I mean, that, that, that series is based on a book by Walter Tevis that was written in 1983. Um, so it, it, it's entirely possible that, uh, that that was one of the models for it. Uh, that finish, that's the end of the questions that I've recorded, but here comes one from Stephen Wright asking what, to what degree were non-Jews welcome to the club? I'm, he, I'm aware he writes that Canon Roy, an Anglican priest, was secretary of the club at one point. I think Irwin can better answer this one. 
there was no uh, um, bar whatsoever, no constraint whatsoever on anybody of any ethnicity or any social class being coming to the chess club. Absolutely, um, it was universal. Which and that, is goes, actually that, goes, that goes right back to the 20s. One of the, I forget the name, but one of the strongest players in the Jewish club in the 20s was not Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, can I, can I say something? Mr. Shekhar. Please go Thank ahead. Thank you, Cecil, for our absolutely magnificent presentation Thank of you. Abe, the Jewish community, chess, and everything, and Irwin for an excellent footnote, which of course you gave also to a magnificent presentation by Celia Rabinovich, also Jewish, on Marcel Duchamp who lived in the days that we were talking about when chess became an art. Chess, like music, like art, can make a man happy. And you echoed those sentiments so excellently. And, uh, well, and I'm, thank I'm you. so pleased thank you, to have attended for this conference. For everyone thank you so else's, much, Cecil Urban. You're welcome. I want to just say for everyone else's benefit, Mr. Shekhar, I talked about the Chess Olympiad. Mr. Shekhar played in the Chess Olympiad for India in the 1960s, so. In, in fact, it was the same event, 1964 in Tel Aviv. And that, that's when I met Abe Yanovsky. Uh, and that's why we went for dinner, which you have forgotten. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, by, by the way, Irwin, you, you said chess was a non-violent game. And surely it is. it is. It is one game where you can play with a person for years and then not know his name. And yet he was absolute emotional feeling for that person. For the fun. It's just, just, just a, a beautiful if I, if game. I, a, if a, I could a, just a, comment on the nonviolence um, yes. in the Chess and Checker Club of New York, which no longer exists on Times Square, uh, used to be right above a brothel, right in Times Square. There was a hole in the wall. And the story I heard is that one player got very upset with another and shoved them through the wall. So apparently um, strong feelings, emotional feelings can spill over. And I, I actually- yeah. I actually, Absolutely. In I fact, actually, the, the, the very phrase you use saying checkmate is from <laughs> Taha Mat. The king is dead. Is dead. <laughs> <laughs> the king is dead. I've killed the king. Yeah. Actually, at that same chess and checker club of New York, I saw again an interesting episode. There was one kid who was very didn't learn respect like I did for Mr. Pinto. He was probably about twelve or fourteen, and he was ridiculing some guy that they said was Sam the Rebbe, meaning he was a teacher. And every time this guy would make a move, the Rebbe would make a move. This kid would ridicule him and laugh and mock him. Finally, this Sam Kent couldn't take it anymore. He turns to the kid and he says, either keep quiet or shut up. <laughs> Those are the two choices. <laughs> but uh, chess is basically, it is basically a nonviolent sport. I, I'd have to say that, despite the fact that the king is dead is part of, uh, part of the origins of checkmate. Yeah. While on the subject, a long time ago, they said, like chess is, is not really a sport, doesn't involve any physical thing. They had a, a scientific uh, analysis of the Oxford Cambridge boat race, which they said each player, each rower lost 3000 calories. 3000 calories is less than a maximum chess game. The, the, you go weaker and weaker. As the tournament goes on, you lose weight. Chess is also a strenuous physical game. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Shekhar, and especially thank you, thank you to Erwin and to Cecil for your wonderful presentations. <laughs> I'm, you know, and I'm almost glad that we didn't have this event a year ago because it means that I can have it now. I suppose I could have had it both, but at the time we did record them. But I do miss seeing someone play simultaneous chess because I've, <clears throat> I've never, I haven't seen that before and I'm sure it would be really, really interesting. So I think we'll, 
wind this up. I thank you very much. And the summary that Mr. Sheffar has given about the, the qualities of the program, I think is, uh, I certainly can't add anything to that. So I will thank you. And I'll say a few things it's about upcoming programs that I hope you'll join us for on May 13th as part of the Caney Lecture Series, the Jewish Heritage Center. Um, these are afternoon programs actually. Uh, with, we'll have a conversation about human rights in the world today with Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador to the United Nations and Erwin Kotler, Canada's special envoy for human rights and preserving the memory of the Holocaust, also former minister of justice and attorney general. On May 30th, as I mentioned before, Little Synagogue on the Prairie, the rural synagogue now in the Calgary Heritage Park uh, presentation, may, main presentation by Irena Karshenbaum of Calgary. June 6th, another Caney lecture. Those of you who are familiar with the Jewish Heritage Center that we have a Caney distinguished lecture in person every year, but of course not last year and not this year. So these are virtual. June 6th, after the pandemic, Israel in the Middle East with Ephraim Halevi, former head of Mossad and the 2012 Caney Distinguished Lecturer here in Winnipeg. You can register for these 